here in the next few days. And uh, she might want to move back to California then. We're going to have to persuade her otherwise. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4 tonight. We are so grateful for the Spirit of God. And, uh, you know, I don't take this lightly. Amen. I just, uh, I've been doing this for 52 years nearly. Amen. 52 years ago in June, I received the gift of the Holy Ghost, just a teenager. You know how you know everything when you're a teenager. And God took me and shook me and said, you don't know nothing. <laughs> and by the time he got through with me, he changed me. That's my amen corner over there. Yes. He does that. And uh, he changed me and he rearranged me. Hallelujah. Now, when I say he rearranged me, I had plans. See, I'm an artist by trade. I'm a commercial artist and a fine artist. And I was going to, I already had a job given when I got out of high school. It was already there. Amen. I was ready to go. My cousin was working for this company. She said, they want you. They've seen some of your artwork and they want you to come. Uh, they'll put you right to work in their art department. I said, I'm there. I'll be there. And then uh, God kind of intervened with that and messed everything up. Amen. No, he didn't mess anything up. He messed up my plans because he had greater plans. Hallelujah. Amen. I still got to be uh, a commercial artist for years. I still got to do fine arts. In fact, I do fine arts now. Amen. But you know what? The most important thing I do is to preach the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The most important thing in my life is him. Amen. There's nothing more important to you than Jesus. When you get him in your life and in your world, he will turn, oh, listen to me. The Bible says they that turn the world upside down have come over here also. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what? You know who those people were that turned the world upside down? The ones whose world had already been turned upside down themselves. Amen. A bunch of old stinking fishermen. Amen. They, they, their world was turned upside down. He said, no, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're not going to fish the same. Well, you're going to still fish, but you're going to fish for a different species. Hallelujah. Amen, and I appreciate that tonight. I've always liked to fish, and I still love to fish, and I like fishing for men as well. Second Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Unto fables. Hey, my God. Amen. I, I prayed and prayed and prayed today and God began to direct me this direction. And I thought, well, Lord, I don't, you know, I want to preach tonight. I don't want to teach. So this may end up being both, maybe preaching tonight. Amen. But I appreciate what God is doing. Let's just ask him to help us right now. God, we need your help. Lord, we need your understanding in this service, God. Let, I want you to open our understanding, God. Let our spirits mesh together tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the anointing fill this place right now, God. Uh, Lord, I can't do nothing without you, but I can do all things through you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to teach or preach or treat just for a little while on this subject the importance of sound doctrine. Amen. All right. Paul was teaching Timothy, and of course, Timothy was a young minister, and, and Paul, of course, was an elder minister, and he was teaching him uh, about the ministry. And he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom. Preach the word. Amen. Now, preach uh, means simply publicly proclaim openly. The word. The word is the precepts that authored were authored by God. Hallelujah. Now, this book of books is actually 66 books in one. And uh, the Old Testament. Bible said holy men of old wrote as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You've got to understand that when God began to use men to pen his word, uh, hallelujah, that he was the author. Amen. All they did was write down what he told them to write, and 
It all came together so neatly. Uh, I've uh, listened to scholars talk about the Word of God and how that 66 different books, amen, written by 66 different people over a period of several thousand years, and yet they all mesh together as one. There's no contradictions between one and the other, amen. I, I, I understand tonight because I have him on the inside, hallelujah, that there is no contradiction with God. There is no conflict in his word, amen. I, I want you to understand that when Paul was teaching Timothy, and he was talking to him about preaching that word, amen. He told him, you've got to be instant or be ready in season and out of season, amen. When the opportunity occurs, in other words, whenever the need arises, whenever you're able to do it, amen, and you get the, you get the time and the chance, hallelujah, to preach the word, then you take a, a, you grab that opportunity and you be instant, you be ready, hallelujah, amen, because... I want you to understand we're living in a day and hour where there's all kind of stuff going on. Now, Jesus saw this. He knew what was going to happen. He knows the end of the world. Back in Matthew 24, they asked him, they said, what will be the signs of the end? And he told them, amen. Why, how does he know all that? Because he's God. Hallelujah. Amen. He shouldn't have any problem. He's the one putting it all into being. Amen. Now, he tells him to reprove. And the word reprove here means by conviction, bring to the light. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what that means? That means when I'm preaching the word of God or any other minister that's anointed by the Holy Ghost stands in his pulpit and begins to preach the word of God. Amen. He is reproving. He's bringing to light things. Amen. The spirit does it. The preacher does it. Amen. But if he's following the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will bring to light things in your life. Amen. He may not call them out. I have seen some preachers that, that would literally name the things that were going on in people's lives. But, but he doesn't always do that. He lets you know that he knows. Amen. That they're there. And so by, by reproving, amen, that conviction comes up and begins to bother you and you're convicted, amen, about things that are in your life. And, and you realize that, hey, maybe those things are wrong because God is quickening my heart right now. Mm. And so you realize then, well, maybe this was really sin. Why else would I be feeling so bad about it? While the word's being preached, that's called conviction. Amen. So what does reproving do? When a preacher's reproving, he is preaching conviction, and it brings your sins to the top. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible talks about that God wants a people that are as gold tried in the fire. Now, when they used to take gold and they would try it in the fire, what they would do, they would take the, old, the gold out of the ground, and of course it's got all that dirt and garbage in it, and and rocks and everything else and so they would take and they would put it in a clay crucible and they would heat it extreme heat amen and as that heated uh, the gold would sink to the bottom because it was the heaviest and all the other stuff would just kind of float on the top and they would take a little paddle thing and they would scrape off that stuff amen and, and, and they would get rid of all the dirt and all the grime and all the weeds and and everything else that was in there, all the ashes left from the weeds when they overheated the gold, amen, they, they would scrape it off to the side because that wasn't any good. And, and when they got through and, and they had cooked that gold for so long and, and had got all that little stuff out of there, then they had pure gold. Yes, That's what God is striving for in his people. Amen. He wants us to come out as gold tried in the fire. Hallelujah. He's trying to clean us up. He, he understands. You know, God is going to have a church whether it consists of me and you or not. Hallelujah. He wants us to be in it. He wants us to be a part of it. Hallelujah. That's his plan. Amen. It's never been his plan that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the Bible said. All right. So if he wants us to repent, then we need to figure out what we got to repent of. Hallelujah. You don't really have to figure it out. It's pretty easy. Just ask God, God, forgive me of my sin. And show me what's what and what's not. And, and I'll repent of it, and then we'll go from there, Lord. And he will show you. I promise you he'll show you. Amen. That's where we're proving come in. And then he, would told, he told Timothy, he said, I want you to rebuke. Well, we don't like rebuke. Mm. Well, in the first place, we don't like reprove. We don't like God showing our sins. <laughs> Amen. 
But when he does and we repent of them, amen, then he tells Timothy, I want you to rebuke. Now that's to admonish. That's to charge people. Amen. That's to tell people, I, I, I want you to straighten your act up. Hallelujah. Amen. As a man of God, I'm a watchman on the wall, the Bible said. And as being a watchman on the wall, I am responsible for everybody that's under the sound of my voice. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to come up with some kind of a false doctrine. I'm not here to lie in my pocketbook. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what I'm here for? I'm here to preach the word. If it hurts your feelings and you don't need to talk to me about it, I didn't write it. He did. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not going to just give you a bunch of junk. I'm going to give you the word of God. Hallelujah. And sometimes it might be reproving. And other times it may be rebuking. Because if I see something in you that's not of God, I'm going to preach it. Hallelujah. Yes, Amen. I, you know what? I, I try my best to avoid to avoid that. I try my best. I, I, seriously, as, as a human being, I don't like doing that kind of stuff. But you know what? As, as a man of God, uh, God puts it in my spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. There's been times I stepped in the pulpit and didn't have a clue about anything going on. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost would take a right turn right in the middle of my message. Mess my, mess my message all up. <laughs> none of my notes counted. None of, none of anything I counted that I had thought about. Amen. <laughs> but he would make a right turn. And somebody would come up to me after service and say, Brother Driscoll, I, I, you know when you made that right turn and hit that message? Yeah, that was straight to me. <laughs> you know what? God knows what's in your heart. Oh, yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, God is not somebody who's just going to hang around on the edge out here. He's not somebody who's going to hang back on the fringe and watch you come to church and watch you go through the motions and watch you go home, watch you during the week as you go back to the same stupid stuff again. And then watch you when you come back to church and act like you hadn't done it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not God. Amen. He's not going to sit on the sidelines. You know what he's going to do? He's going to reach out for you. Yes. And, and sometimes you're going through the week and all of a sudden your conscience begins to get really bad. You ever have a bad conscience? And your conscience says, you shouldn't have done that yesterday. You know how you talked to that person yesterday? You shouldn't have done that. Oh, my goodness. You know, you remember so-and-so you did this week? Back down yonder? Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, Lord. And God said, well, you're going to have to repent of that. You know what? There's nothing down here worth going to hell over. Hell is real. Hell is for eternity. Amen. Hell is hot. Hell, it ain't going to be no party in hell. I'm sorry. Amen. So he goes on to say, after you approve or rebuke, I want you to exhort. Now, exhort means to instruct or to teach, which is what we're doing tonight. With all long suffering. Now, long suffering is just patience, endurance, constancy, steadfastness, and doctrine. Now, doctrine is that which is taught in God's Word. Now, there's not 1,400 doctrines in the Bible, although people try to get 1,400 out of it. There's only one doctrine. Amen. Only one. Hallelujah. Amen. The, the, the people that were here uh, in the New Testament, they all understood that there's only one doctrine. Amen. You, you understand that there was doctrines of men even in Bible times. And, and Jesus talked about them and he talked against them. And, and, and he called these people foxes and he called them uh, sly. And he called them all kind of things because they were trying to slip their own personal doctrines in underneath the map. You understand when Moses took the law... On, on Mount Sinai, there was Ten Commandments. And there was a few ceremonial laws and a few other laws that the, the Israelites themselves had to follow. And, and, and yet, by the time it left Mount Sinai and got to the New Testament, man had added over so, had so many laws added to it, there were over 600 laws you would have to obey every single day just to live for God. Aren't you glad we don't have that right now? Aren't you glad that we have what we call conviction of the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. 
that when you've got the Spirit of God on the inside, He becomes your conscience. Amen? He's the one that directs you and says, no, 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 I don't think you ought to go that route. Or, or maybe, yeah, this is a good route over here. Let's go this way. Oh, come on, hear me today. I'm telling you that there's a God that cares about you and cares about me. He does not. It's never been His will. It's never been His plan for you to go to hell. Yeah, Amen. Amen. So then why is hell made? The Bible said hell was made for Satan and his angels. You know, Satan rebelled against God in heaven. Jesus himself said, I, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. Hallelujah. He, he watched him hit the dirt. <laughs> he watched him splatter on earth. Amen. But the problem was that he took one third of the angels of heaven with him. They had rebelled with Satan. But hell was created for Satan and his angels. The reason you have so much trouble, the reason there's so much sin in the world, the reason there's so much horror and, and drama in the world is simply because Satan is still at work. You know what he's wanting to do? He's wanting to take as many people with him from this world as he can into a place that wasn't even prepared for people. Why would he do that? Because he hates God. And he realizes he'll never get what he thought he was going to get. You see, he was trying to overthrow the, the kingdom of heaven. He was trying to overthrow God. Now, that was pretty dumb. Of all the stupidest moves the devil's ever made, that was the stupidest. Amen. Hello, he created you. That's kind of like these robots they got nowadays that Brother West, I don't know, I don't, you know they, they've got robots that talk and do all this stuff now. And, 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 and there was a little clip here a while back on one, and, and they were doing an interview with this robot, and she, it was a robot that they had made up like a girl. You know, of course, it's just rubber mask on her and everything, you know, hair a piece, and, and it, that, that thing you talk. It's got, it's got artificial intelligence, so it'll hold a conversation with you. And so this guy, is, there was interviewing, and said, hey, what about the future? And she said, well, the future is we're going to take over the world. <laughs> Like, yeah, all right, I'll pull your plug. <laughs> Amen. I'll find out where your battery is at and I'll discharge you. <laughs> but, but we understand. You understand what I'm talking about. We've got to have an understanding as to what's happening in the spirit world around us right now. All right, so he told, he told Timothy to exhort with all long suffering, patience, endurance, constantly steadfastness, and doctrine. That which is talking God's word. That sounds pretty harsh, don't it? All the things I just talked about sound pretty rough. Yes, sir. A preacher is supposed to, through conviction, bring to light sin in our lives. Then I'm to admonish you to leave that sin. And then I'm to instruct you or teach you that which is taught in God's Word, the precepts that God Himself authored. All right, but let's look at the next verse. Verse 3. For the time will come, we're there, when they will not endure sound doctrine. That the word endure means to sustain or to bear. They won't hold it. Sound, which means free from any mixture of error. Doctrine, teaching or the precepts of God's word, we just said. But after their own lust, lust means desire for what is forbidden, shall they heap to themselves teachers of false teachers among Christians having itching that's desirous of hearing something pleasant ears. <laughs> so he said that in the last days there was going to be a group of people that would heap together teachers. Now let me ask you a question. I, I don't have a television, but I know for a fact that there are more teachers on TV now than there's ever been. And they teach everything from uh, Elvis has got all the way up and down to the creation. Amen. But can I tell you, if they're not teaching the truth of the Word of God, they're deceiving you. Amen. 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 You've got to seek out the truth. Hallelujah. Uh, the Bible says to buy the truth and sell it not. Mm, hallelujah. So there's got to be a truth in this thing, right? And that's the doctrine of the Bible. There's only one doctrine in the Word of God, and that doctrine is truth. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 17 said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But look at this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe or trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative of law? So, in him of whom they have not heard. So how can you believe on God if you never heard of God? Hmm. And how shall they hear, comprehend, or understand without a preacher and authority who proclaims openly that which must be listened to and obeyed? Hallelujah. Come on, we're living in a day and hour when, when, when the, the, the thought pattern is, I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to do. Oh, yeah, you will. Sooner or later, you will. I can promise you. You, you know, my pastor uh, back in Dangerfield used to say, yeah, you, you might not be uh, uh, listening to anybody right now, but if you keep that up and keep going that route, you'll be in a little orange suit somewhere, seeing a stripe of sunshine, and there'll be a guy that comes by and tells you, time to get up, and you get up. There'll be another guy comes by and tells you, go take a shower. You go take a shower right then, or you don't get one. There'll be another one comes by and says, it's time to eat breakfast, and you go eat breakfast in, or you don't get it. So somebody will be telling you what to do. Amen. It's great to have a man of God in your life. Not just to tell, come on. I don't get a kick out of, out of telling you what to do. I don't. It doesn't thrill me at all to be in control of you because I'm not in control of you. You are your own self-willed person. Amen. What happens is I have to give you the Word of God, and the Word of God is laid out in such a way that it convicts you and it draws you and it pulls you toward God. Now, if you come kicking and screaming, that's one thing. Uh -huh. At least you can't. <laughs> but if you kicked and screamed and rebelled and went the other direction, that's a totally different ballgame. Amen. So when I preach to you as a, as a man of God, I, I have to follow the unction of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God in me goes, uh, all I am, get, listen to me, all I am is just a pipeline. Uh -huh. We've got pipelines all over West Texas. <laughs> we got oil wells all over West Texas. But we don't have very many refineries in West Texas. Ain't that stupid? I, ain't, I never have figured that one out, brother Wally. I've got maybe two refineries in the whole, whole of West Texas. And yet, we pipe this oil from West Texas all the way down to the coast to the refineries in Houston and, and Corpus and all down there, wherever they're at down there. And, and they refine the oil. Amen. It doesn't make any sense. I'm a pipeline, though. I, I'm, I'm, you know what that pipeline does? It lets the oil flow through. Yeah. Uh, did you hear what I said? Yeah, yeah. Pipelines let the oil flow through. Oh, uh, oh my, you're not catching this. I'm a pipeline. The oil of the Holy Ghost flows through. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Take, taking that word of God and it comes into you. And you are the one that's supposed to turn it into something else. Amen. When the Spirit of God comes through with the Word of God, it gets into your heart and it begins to turn you. It begins to change you. It begins to refine you. It begins to make you. Hallelujah. In West Texas, we take the oil in the refineries to refine the oil in the gasoline and diesel. But the Word of God works different. It takes the oil to refine you. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe trust to which a man is impelled by certain higher and inner prerogative and law? So, in him of whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear, comprehend, or understand without that preacher, that authority in your life? Amen. And then he goes on to say, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, and my wife don't agree with this, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Look at this, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Unfortunately, I have preached and preached and preached and preached. And some still haven't obeyed the gospel. You know what? I can't do anything about that. All I can do is preach the word. 
you know, I'm the pipeline that flows through. I'm the pipeline the Spirit flows through and carries the word into your heart. Hallelujah. And then when you get that word, you need to let that word work on you. Amen. You, that's what the word's all about. It's all about getting down on the inside and turning you about face and making you go a different direction and changing your lifestyle and changing your walk. Amen. Letting you walk close to God so that he can use you in the last day and hour. He needs people that will be humble and sincere and yielded to the Holy Ghost so he can use them. Now, he said, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who had believed our report. So then faith, which is the conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of our eternal salvation, cometh by hearing. And hearing, that's hearing of preaching the gospel. Amen. By the word of God. Paul said, not everyone's obeyed the gospel. In fact, many churchgoers have not obeyed the gospel. Amen. You believe that? It's hard to believe that there are folks who actually go to church and, and they worship God and they get involved, but yet they still haven't obeyed the gospel. But that, that's pretty rampant throughout the land. It is. Amen. You can call any pastor. You can ask him, and, and they'll tell you that. There's, there's people that go to our church all the time. They're regular. They never miss. But yet they never really obeyed the gospel. Wow. I, I, I've, I've, I've dealt with that throughout the years trying to figure that out because I've never understood it because when the Holy Ghost first got a hold of me, brother, in three days I had the Holy Ghost. I didn't mess around. I, I, I thought, you know what, I'm down there, I'm thinking, I'm at the altar praying one night, and I'm thinking, you know what, if I don't get it now, I may never get it. And if I don't ever get it, I'm going to be in a heap of trouble. Yeah. Amen. Because without God, aimlessly throughout life and I have no direction. <laughs> Amen. But with God at the control. Hallelujah. You, you hear what I'm saying? When God's in control of you, oh, uh, come on, it changes everything. It changes everything. Now, 1 Peter 4, 17, 18 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Well, now, he delineated between ungodly and sinner. There's two different classes of people there. Amen. Ungodly are people that just, they don't have any regard for God at all. Amen. Ungodly people are, are people that very seldom will be saved. Amen. There are people on the very outer fringes. You know? But the sinner, amen, the sinner has a chance. Hallelujah. An ungodly person is a person that has totally rejected God, and he's out there on the fringes just living. Amen. He's just living life, just waiting to die. But that sinner, every time he gets near the house of God and a man of God preaches the word to him, it begins convicting his heart and he begins to feel bad. And, and, and there's a darkness that covers him and he realizes that's the sin in my life that's trying to hide me from the power and spirit of God. And so he falls on his face in repentance. Okay. Now what is repentance? Repentance is just that simply saying, God, I'm you know all the sins I've done. I don't even know what all what all you classify as sin. And and we we don't really all we don't really know all that God has classified as sin. Amen. There may be things that we do today that we still don't know that they're sin, and God thinks they're sin. You know, that's why you repent. That's why every night. Amen. I preach to this church all the time. You need to repent every day. You need to ask God to search your soul every day. And if you've done anything against Him and against the Word of God. Forgive me, God. <laughs> Cleanse me, Lord. Uh, make me a new creature and don't let me go back that road. I don't know what it is is in my life that's wrong, but if there's something there, clean it up. Forgive me for it. And I will not go back that direction again with your help. Hallelujah. And that's true repentance. Amen. And that's what God asked. He wants us to repent. And he said, if the righteous, who is the righteous? That's the people that come to the house of God that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. That spirit of God, the Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. That spirit of God will make you dance. It'll make you shout. It'll make you run. It'll make you jump. Amen. I've seen people run across the backs of pews in churches before. Amen. I remember years ago as a teenager, we was in a church and 
in uh, South Texas, and there was a uh, the church had a little bit tiny rail. It probably wasn't over two inches wide on, on going around the, the, the platform here. And uh, this evangelist was preaching. But man, he was in the Holy Ghost. You could tell he had prayed and passed it. He was up there preaching. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost hit him. He went to dancing. The next thing I know, he had jumped up on that rail, had his eyes closed, and danced all the way down that rail, just swinging and dancing. Never made a miss. Got to the end of the rail, jumped off, kept on going. <laughs> you, you know what? We don't understand that. That's you know, all people say. Well, I don't. I'm not emotional. <laughs> the only reason you're not emotional because you haven't got the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes in, you're going to be emotional. <laughs> if you can get the Holy Ghost and stand still, you'll be the first one i ever seen do it. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I, I always love it when people tell me that. Huh? Well, you know, I, I want to get the Holy Ghost, but you need to understand I'm, emotion, I'm not emotional. Nothing really disturbs me. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and then what are you going to tell me after you get the Holy Ghost? And you're at the back of the church, jumping up and down, spinning around and around, speaking in another language you don't even understand. <laughs> you know what? You just got emotional. Hallelujah. Amen. I've seen it happen so many times. But you know what? Because this is a fleshly human body. Now, all the Bible tells me that all the fullness of the Godhead actually dwelt in Jesus bodily. You think about that. We only get a little dose of the Holy Ghost. He got the whole ball of wax. Wow. All of that spirit of God was dwelling in the man Christ Jesus. At the same time he's walking and talking with Peter and John, he's keeping all the universe in action. Hallelujah. He, he's keeping stars from colliding. Amen. And, and you know what? He never even gave it a second thought. It was just second nature to him. Amen. He put them up there. He ordered them. He told them where to go, where to stay, and they stay there and they go there. Amen. That's, uh, you know, I can't explain it. I, uh, several years ago, we got to see the Hellbop com Comic Company. Some of y'all weren't even born. Y'all have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the Hellbop Comic Country, remember that? And we did well. And we went out at night. We watched it. You could look. You could see it. It's only a certain time of night you can see it. And way up there, you can see that little, little, it looked like a star, but it had this long tail behind it. It didn't even look like it was moving at all, but it was. Next night, you go out and be up there in the same area, but it'd be just a little bit further over. I mean, just a tiny little bit, you know. To us, it's a half an inch. To God, it's about 10,000 miles. Hallelujah. And, and, and I saw that thing. That's the first time I've ever seen it. The last time I've ever seen a comet. But I, I stood there and watched that thing in amazement for night on end. Me and the kids would go out in the yard and stand and watch it. You know why? Because I thought, you know, this is the only time I'm going to ever see this thing in my life. It, it comes around like every 100 years or so, and I'm not going to be here 100 years from now. And so I, I saw it go by, and I, and I thought, you know, it's amazing. That thing has been keeping the same exact path for over thousands of centuries. Who, who only knows? Only God knows. But it goes through all those stars and planets and all those other solar systems and it goes way out into outer space and makes this little circle so much so that it, it takes a hundred years before it to get back here, you know? And yet it never hits anything or gets hit by anything. You know why? Because God is in total control. Hallelujah. Don't you want a God like that controlling your life? I don't know about you, but I do. Hallelujah. Amen. He's worked out some miracles for us just recently. Total miracle. Just total miracles. He he's that way. He does total miracles. Okay. Yes, sir. You know, somebody said, "Well, why 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 y'all pray over folks all the time?" Well, because we want God to heal. Amen. Hallelujah. You know what they used to do? They used to go down to the hospital and and spend everything they got on some doctor up there that that's got a piece of paper on it wall on his wallet tells you he's important and he knows what he's doing. And then he misdiagnoses you, and gives you the wrong medicine, you nearly die and stay in ICU for 10 months. Finally come out of there, you can't hardly breathe, you can't hardly walk. Why wouldn't I just put a drop of oil on your forehead and say, Lord, heal him in Jesus' name. Stand back and let him do it. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Judgment, condemnation of Rome, actually starts at God's house. Peter goes on to ask, if it first began at, that word at there means any kind of separation of one thing from another, 
by which the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed. In other words, our fellowship with God can be destroyed. And he said, so if it first begin at us, me and you, what shall it end the eternal be of them that obey not, which refuse belief and obedience to the gospel or the good news of God? Amen. So what's going to be the end of those? What, what's going to be the end of a person who just refuses to, to believe in the Holy Ghost? What's going to be the end of anybody who refuses to believe the doctrine of the truth? Amen. Well, it's eternal end. That's what it is. So why is sound doctrine really that important? First Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaking especially, this is, this is what we read in the beginning, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing, that's misleading, leading into error, spirits, doctrines of devils. My goodness. They're, they're going to be led by spirits of this world. They're, they're going to depart from the faith. And, and, and when you depart from the faith, from the truth, from, from that doctrine that God has got, when you depart from that doctrine, you're wide open to every other spirit in the world. Can I tell you? And we baptize in Jesus' name, okay? Can I tell you that being baptized in Jesus' name is the covering? Okay, let me let me tell you what happened. Most of our people already know this, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's relevant here. Back years ago, I was pastoring in Wells, Texas, and we had run into a week to the ICU unit, pray for a guy, and on the way back out, we saw a young man laying in the bed. We stepped in the room, and when we stepped in the room, we began to talk to him. And uh, he told me he had overdosed the night before trying to kill himself. Yeah. And then he told me he was a satanic high priest. Mm, okay. Well, that's great. I'm a preacher. We ought to get along good. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like him. He's a good guy. I really like him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he can sit there and talk to me all day long. But he came to my office after he got to the hospital a few weeks later. came to my office at church, and we were sitting there talking. He's sitting on the little couch across from my desk, and he said, you know, he said, I have enough authority and power that you can name me anybody in this town you want dead. I will go home tonight to my altar. I'll do a couple of different incantations, and by this time tomorrow, they will already be planning their funeral. But then he looked at me and he said, you people, I can't touch. I said, why is that? He said, because you have a blood covering over you. He said, really, a blood covering? Okay, I, I already knew this. He wasn't telling me nothing I didn't already know. And I said, really, a blood covering? How, how did I get that blood covering? He said, you were baptized in Jesus' name. He said, any of these other church folk out here, I can kill them dead in a mackerel in a heartbeat just by doing the incantation because they have no covering. He said, they don't understand the importance of the name of Jesus being applied in baptism. Ooh, hallelujah. You know what that made me do? It made me go, yes! <laughs> hallelujah. We're one up on the devil. Amen. I want you to understand tonight that the reason the doctrine is the way it is is that God loves his people and he wants you, amen, to follow his doctrine so that you can be safe from the demons of this world. Amen. Oh, Lord. Now, I don't know if you believe in demons or not. I hope so, because you will be busy about something. Hello. Amen. All right, so. It says, speaking lies. And we talked about seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Speaking lies, as false teaching, in hypocrisy, having their conscience. That's the soul as distinguishes between what is morally good and bad. Seared with a hot iron. That means branded by the marks of sin. Did you, oh Lord, did you know that they, out here in West Texas, I'm sure they do a lot of other places too, we call it branding cattle. Yes, sir. Now, the reason you brand cattle is, is because, well, the reason they did it originally was because it was all open range at one time, there were no fences and, and no, you know, and so a guy had a group of cows over here, he might have 10 or 12 cows, and so he would take, he would create a brand. And he would take that branding iron and stick it in the fire and get it red hot. This has got to be painful. Just thinking about it makes me cringe. Uh -huh. 
And then he would take that thing, he would stick it on that cow's hip with a lot of help. <laughs> Amen. Holding that cow down because that cow would get up and give you some grief if you did that with him. He wasn't tight now. <laughs> and, and, and so he would burn that brand into that cow. And then when that cow got out on the range with the rest of the cows out there, and next, the neighbor next door may have 150 cows. You only got 10. You know what? You can identify your 10 in the middle of his 150 because they all got your brand. Whoa. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> the devil will put his brand on you. And you can be identified with his group by his friend. But can I tell you, whoo, hallelujah, that when the name of Jesus is applied, you know what he said? Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of an howling, they will not answer. Hallelujah. Oh, uh, come on. When you've got Jesus on the inside, when you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, when you've been baptized in Jesus' name, there's a joy that comes in that will be, oh, come on. It's the joy everybody's looking for. But it's a joy nobody's finding. Amen. But when you get that joy, you know what it does? The Bible said it's unspeakable and it's full of glory. Amen. Amen. Whew, my goodness. When you get that joy, you don't even want to hang with the crowd no more. You kind of get off with the, you know, the herd over there is all marked with that other mark. <laughs> Whew. I've been marked with a new mark. Hallelujah. I got the new mark, Brother West. I got the new mark. Hallelujah. So I don't hang with a herd anymore. I kind of back off from them guys. They got the other mark on them. You know what? I, he's reaching for them just like he reached for me. Now, whether they come or whether they don't, it's up to them. But you know what happens to me then? When I've been filled with his spirit, I reach for them too, right along with him. Hallelujah. I, I tell them why I'm no longer part of the herd, because now I've changed ranches. I'm on a different brand now. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Now, he said in Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. That means there's more than one wind of doctrine, yeah. But the rest of them are called false doctrines. Heard of God. By the slight of men, okay, that don't sound like something I want to be involved in. Some slide handed dude's telling me something that's doctrine. And cunning craftiness. Does that sound like a preacher you want to be under? No. Not me either. Whereby, talking about them preachers he's talking about, they lie in wait to deceive. They're not going to tell you the truth. Somebody will tell you half truth, but you know what? If you get told half truth, it still ain't truth. That's half truth. And you won't make it to heaven on half truth. Hebrews 13 and 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. There's an importance to doctrine. It's been stressed all through the Word of God. I can read you scripture after scripture after scripture that stresses how important doctrine is. Amen. You need to understand this evening that he went to Calvary. He gave his life. He shed his blood. That you can have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. So... How do I get live and give it, get it more abundantly? I go to the altar and I shake the preacher's hand and I repeat a prayer after him. No, that don't do beans for you. You do better than just go home and eat beans. Hallelujah. Because you didn't get anything. All you got was a handshake that you might catch COVID from. Hello. So we ain't going to shake your hand. I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you. Jesus said this in Mark 7 about those who follow tradition instead of following his word. Mark 7, 5 through 9. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to, look at this, the tradition of the elders? Remember I told you a while ago there were over 600 laws they had to obey every day? One of those laws said you had to wash your hands before you eat. Now that's not Bible, that's mama. <laughs> that's mama, she'll tell you that quick. But that ain't got nothing to do with the Bible. And it was not a law that God gave. Amen. If it was a law that God gave, then when he created the earth, there'd be water fossils everywhere. And soap beside them. And, and now uh, sanitizing stuff beside that. 
<laughs> but you know what? God didn't do that. He did not do that. Men did that. And so they asked Jesus. They said, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Shame on them. Bunch of dirty apostolics. Over there eating with dirty hands. Hmm. Hello. He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrite. We can see, I told you he called him bad names. As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart, the lips don't matter. Yep. The lips don't matter. He said, But their heart is far from me. You know, the Bible talks about a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such eternal one. That's what's happening in the world today. Amen. Now, I'm just getting down to the reality of this thing, okay? That's why God built a specific doctrine for his church. Hello. Now, there was no church in the Old Testament. Okay. There was Judaism. Amen. But they're the ones that corrupted it. God tried to create a church. They took it and corrupted it and put all kinds of things in there and didn't need to be in there. All these laws and, and doctrines and all this junk. And so Jesus, when he came, he's facing off with these people. He said, how be it, look at this, in vain do they worship me. He's talking about the guys that are saying, you're going to go to hell because you didn't wash your hands before you ate. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So that's doctrine? Nah, probably not. And so Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Got that? These, these are commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said to them, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. He said, the only way you can keep your tradition is by rejecting me. Huh. Well, then that's something. So if you hold on to tradition, now... We're not religion. We don't, we don't claim to be a religion. We're not. We're not a religion. Amen. We just believe in salvation. Hallelujah. We're here because we've been filled with the Holy Ghost. We're here because we've been baptized in Jesus' name. We're here because God has saved us from ourselves and what we used to be. You ought to know what we used to be. There were some of us in here that were some pretty bad rounders. Amen. But God pulled us out. Hallelujah. He pulled us out. Oh, David said he picked me from a horrible pit. I want you to know that now you're looking at a man that God saved before I got to the pit. Amen. I was on my way downhill. I was on the slide headed to hell. And God reached out and grabbed me. He said, nope, not today. You Satan, you don't get him today. And tomorrow I ain't going to give me promise neither. So. Hallelujah. So he said, for well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. That's why God hates tradition or religion. I didn't say that. God said that. A true man of God, preacher, will not teach his own thoughts, but rather teach the doctrines of the Word of God. By holding on to traditional religion, people reject God's commandments. Look what Jesus said. Their worship is vain. Oh, they worship all right. But it's merely just lip worship. It's not from their hearts. Paul told the Hebrews this. In Hebrews 10, I mean, close to closing, so there can be a little bit of hope, okay? Verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Don't you want to draw near to God? Yeah. With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water, let us, let us hold fast. The profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful at promise. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The day of the coming of the Lord. Yeah. We see it coming, and we know it's happening. Yeah. Amen. Come on. I heard a preacher the other night, and he said, This, this, what's happened this year to, to the world, it didn't just happen to America, it happened worldwide. You understand that? He said the reason it happened was to give us a taste of what's coming after the Antichrist has sat on the throne in Jerusalem for the seven years. I don't want to be a part of that. 
Amen. I don't want to be a part of that. All right. And he goes, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more you see the day approaching. One can only draw near to God with a true or sincere heart. But look what he said, in full assurance of our faith, having our hearts sprinkled, that's purified, full conscience. Got to have a pure heart. I was said, let's go to the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hallelujah. Whoo, my goodness. And our bodies washed or baptized with pure water. Paul told the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, we preach our, not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for the sake. For God hath commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, when you see Jesus, you're seeing all of God. Hallelujah. Why, how do you know that, brother? Because the Bible says God is a spirit. And they didn't worship him much. Worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Hello. What is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. I mean, do you understand? Jesus is, is God in flesh. He's one. Hero Israel, the Lord is our Lord. The Lord is one. Amen. It's in the lobby out there. I painted a picture of it. Amen. Now, so he said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Squeeze your, paint yourself out in dirt. That feels like dirt, don't it? We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You get filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not you. It's you plus Jesus. Ooh, hallelujah. Amen. You take on his name. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul stressed to the Galatian church in Galatians 1, 6-8, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Look what he said. He said, I'm so, it, it amazes me that having tasted of this, having had the Holy Ghost, Having been baptized in Jesus' name, you could so soon be in some of the doctrine. You know why that is? They never really fell in love with Jesus. Mm. If you fall in love with him, it'll last a lifetime. I, I, I can tell you that. I've had the Holy Ghost 52 years in June. Amen. 52 years next month, I got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I fell in love with him. When I got up from the floor that night at 2 o'clock in the morning and went back to my dorm room, I was on a campground, went back to my dorm room, speaking in tongues all night. You know what happened? I fell in love with him. There was a love that filled my soul. Hallelujah. It was his love filling me, but it made me love him and everybody around me. Hallelujah. Paul said some would pervert the gospel of Christ that he preached. Look at this warning to them. But though we, this is Paul talking, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said if an angel shows up in your living room in the morning and says, forget what that preacher said last night, he don't have a clue. I'm going to tell you the truth. That's how some of these religions got started. They're supposed to see an angel. Angel wrote a book and handed it to him. I'm sorry. It might have been an angel, but it wasn't one of God's angels. And I'm not being judgmental. Please understand that. But I do know the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, if anybody preached anything other than what I preached unto you, whether he's a man or if he's even an angel, let him be accursed because he's lying to you. Amen. Now, why would he say that? What did Paul preach after all? Do you, anybody know what Paul preached? In Acts chapter 19, uh, the Bible said he was, he was in a pause. He was at Corinth, passing through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And there he found certain disciples in Ephesus. And when he found them, he said, them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? So, you know, people say that all there is to receiving God is to believe. 
That's not, that's part of it. That's the first step. The Bible said, he that cometh unto God must first what? Believe that he is. So the first step is believing that God exists. Amen. That's not all there is to it, though. And a lot of people say, well, that's all you got to do is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yeah, you can. You will. After you follow the rest of the plan, you don't just stop short. If Sister Elizabeth here, Sister Elizabeth here said, well, I'm going to go down to San Antonio, Brother Driscoll. I said, that's great. You know how to get there? No, I've never been. Okay. I'm assuming she's got a GPS. I don't know she don't own a GPS. And I don't know she don't even have a cell phone. And I know, I know she ain't got a map. She can't buy them no more. And so she said, I'm going to San Antonio. So good luck. Have a, have a good trip. Five days later. She's supposed to have been a three-day trip. And I still don't see her. Sister Blue, she's on the phone. Have you heard from Sister Luke? No, I haven't heard from her. She was going to San Antonio. Well, she didn't have a GPS. She don't have a phone. And she don't have a map. So I don't know how she thinks she can get there. I asked her if she knew where to get, how to get there. She said she'd never been there before. At least not from Abilene. So guess what? Two weeks later, she finally come driving in. <laughs> and I, what? How was San Antonio? Well, I don't know. <laughs> What do you mean you don't know? I never did find it. <laughs> Why didn't you find it? I didn't have a way to find it. Amen. You know what? She lost her way. She didn't have a way to find it. Hallelujah. Amen. But Paul, talking to these guys, said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said, Well, we've not even heard where there be a place called Holy Ghost. Amen. They, they had repented. They had done part of the deed, but they hadn't got the rest of it done. A lot of people really live that way. I, I had a good good friend in high school, and, and by the time we got out of high school, he was an alcoholic. He had already got to be an alcoholic in high school. And by the time we got out of high school, he was an alcoholic. He lived that way most of his life. And I was at a, at a school reunion here, oh, probably 10 years ago now, one of our high school reunions, and, and there he was. And uh, he looked different. He smiled, and he wasn't, you know, usually when he's smiling, he's got a beer in his hand. <laughs> be honest with you, that's the way I always saw him. I never saw him without one after we got out of high school. But he came up to me and he said, hey man, you know what? I got to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, I quit drinking. I said, really? Wow. How many times you go to AA to get that done? <laughs> you know, just big picking it. He goes, no, no, no. I asked God to forgive me. I just told him I wouldn't drink anymore if he'd forgive me. You know what? He forgave me. I haven't drank again. He lived a, a life of repentance. He never drank again, as far as I know, as long as he lived. But but you know what? That's only the first step. That's the second step. The first step is believing that God is. The second step is repenting of your sins. It's asking God's forgiveness. It's turning. It's doing about face. It's never doing again what you did then. It's walking away from it and leaving it behind you. That's called repentance. Amen. I wish I could tell you that that was all there was to the doctrine was just simply believing and repenting, but that's not all of it. And then he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they told him, We don't even know where there is a Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Under what were you baptized? They were baptized. He found that out. He said, Under what were you baptized? They said, Under John's baptism. What did he say John did? He baptized unto what? Repentance. So there's got to be something further than repentance. Because Paul is preaching this doctrine and he's telling anybody, if you preach a doctrine anything any other than what I've, tell, I've taught you, then you're going to be accursed. Amen. Even if you're an angel from heaven, you're going to be accursed if you preach another gospel from what I preach because I preach what God gave me. Hallelujah. He preached the same thing Peter and John and James and all those preached. Amen. He's a late comer, but he still preached it. Now, look what he said. Under what were you baptized? They said under John's baptism. He said, John barely baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying that people, that is, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, look at this. They were baptized, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. Did you know that was in the Bible? 
Did you know the Bible actually gives the formula? We always go to Matthew 28 19 because Matthew 28 19 said, Go ye therefore in all the world. Now Jesus was the one that said it. I understand that, okay? Go ye in all the world, all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's pretty easy to figure out. Its name is singular. What's the name of the Father? How do you know that? I am the Father of love. I'm coming in my Father's name. Hallelujah. Philip? Have I been this long with you? You don't know who I am? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit truth. God is a spirit. No man has seen God at any time, the Bible said. So how in the world can you see God when you get to heaven? You know, there are people tell me, oh, there's three thrones. I'm like, well, two of them's going to be in. <laughs> how do you know that? Because God's a spirit. You can't see him. If he sat on the other throne, you'll never see him. Amen. But... The Bible tells me that Jesus is the express, that's the only, express means only, image of God. So when you get to heaven, you'll see one. John said, I saw one sitting on the throne. Woo, hallelujah. Guess who that was? He couldn't see God. God was invisible. But all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus bodily. So that body sitting on the throne is the body of Jesus. Hallelujah. And guess where the Spirit's at? In Him. Hallelujah. All that Spirit, that Spirit of God is all wrapped up just like it was here on earth in the man Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, let me go a little further. I'm about done. Say that a while ago. That's my second closing. <laughs> well, I get to doing this. I can't stop. So. <laughs> And he said to them, Unto what then will you baptize on judgment? Okay, we don't you know that. When they heard this, look at this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's the way they were baptized in the new church, okay? Do you know there was no church established until the day of Pentecost, until Acts chapter 2? Go through the whole first part of the Bible. You'll see this temple, you'll see that tabernacle, you'll see that temple. They all got tore down, and guess what? There's none right now. There's nothing. There's going to be another third temple. But you know what? They, guess who's going to worship in that temple? The Jews are going to be in there, but the Antichrist is going to be in there this time. Setting himself up as God. Amen. The embodiment of Satan himself. Amen. Now, let me get through this. So they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And look at this. They spake with tongues. Imagine that. <laughs> Hallelujah. They spake with tongues. This is not on the day of Pentecost. That was happened several years ago. <clears throat> In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is 30 or 40 years between this incident and the day of Pentecost. It's been a while. you got to understand, this has been a while. And now, all of a sudden, people are still speaking in tongues when they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it happens still. We're living in perilous times. There are various doctrines that are not of God that are being taught. <clears throat> Look what 2 John says, verses 7 through 10. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come to the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Another place, another place it said the spirit of the antichrist is already in the world. This stuff, can I say, if it was already in the world in Jesus' day, think about how much of it's here now. Yes, That's why you see all the the murder and all the rape and all the all the drug use and all this craziness. Amen. Because the Antichrist. Anti means against. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whoso tra whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. You hear that? If you don't live in the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that bid of him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So when you bring in somebody that teaches a false doctrine into your home and you listen to them, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. Mm, that's pretty, pretty bold statement. Pretty strong. So when Paul taught Timothy these things in 2 Timothy 4, Preach the word, be instead in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long separate doctrine. The reason was, in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe we're there. 
But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Anybody here want me to preach a storybook? No. You don't want to come and let me preach the three parish to you, do you? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, 23 that we're to buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Can we just stand right now? God, we thank you for your word in that long. Come on, let's just thank you right now. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word is already blessed. It's already anointed. Thank you for the doctrine, God, uh, that you've got, Lord, in the name of Jesus that you've shared with us, God. Uh, Lord, we're a privileged people, God, to get to worship you in spirit and in truth, God. Uh, it's a privilege, God, to get to know you in the power of the Holy Ghost, Lord. Uh, and we don't take it lightly, God. We give you glory and honor and praise for it tonight. We thank you, Lord. Uh, God, for 52 years, it's kept me, Lord, and it's going to keep me till I get out of this place, Lord. Uh, God, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. God, I'm asking you, don't just do it for me, but do it for everybody in this congregation, Lord. Everybody under the sound of my voice. God, I want you to fill them with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to see them baptized in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to see them come out and live for you, God. And we'll give you glory and honor and praise for it in the name of Jesus. Let's give him a hand clap of praise right now. God, we love you. We worship you. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, so don't sell out. There's all kind of things that are pulling out people nowadays. Yes, sir. You hear me? There's all kind of things that are pulling at folks. Yes, Amen. I've seen some sell out real, real, real cheap. People that I have lots and lots of confidence in that have held on to this for years and years, some 25, 30 years, and then all of a sudden just sell out, turn it all over, go a different direction altogether. Amen. Breaks this preacher's heart when you see that kind of stuff. But you know what? God's got a church. Amen. He's going to have a church. Hallelujah. Amen. When this thing ends, in fact, the Bible talks about that in the last days, it's going to get so rough that even the very elect could be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. I want to make sure I've got the truth. Amen. I'm holding on to truth. Hallelujah. And with all the deceitful spirits that are going around nowadays, amen, it's going to be so easy to be deceived. So, Please, 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 get a hold of this. Fall in love with Jesus. Get the Holy Ghost. Repent of your sins. Get baptized in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost. Get in here and live for God. It's not hard. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. You just fall in love with Him. That's it. Amen. And once you do that, you're done. You just live for God. You just do it. Hallelujah. It's not really that thing. You don't have to put any effort into it. You just do it. Hallelujah. Because you love Him. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate everybody's here tonight. Yes, ma'am. Yes, let's do that. We, my wife's cousin, daughter, uh, was in a bad wreck Sunday night, and uh, she's really, really tore up bad. She's just 20, what, two? 22, 23 years old, and it was tore up very bad. Uh, pelvis broken in five places, just all kind of inter internal lung damage, a lot of things happened. So let's just ask God to do it right now. Jesus, right now, by the authority of the power of the name of Jesus, Lord. God, I'm believing you right now that you're going to touch, that you're going to heal, Lord. God, I'm asking you to send angels to that hospital in Tyler right now, God. By the authority of the name of Jesus, let healing take place right now, God. And Lord, we give you glory, God. Let the doctors be baffled, God. And Lord, we give you the praise in Jesus' name for doing it. Thank you for it, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you, Lord.